Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jennifer Gray. I'm the Public Services Coordinator for FSCJ Library and Learning Commons, and I'd like to welcome you today to A Genius of Florida, Zora Neale Hurston's Visionary Legacy. A couple little pieces of housekeeping before we get started this afternoon. I do want to let you know, you may have noticed as you entered the room, you have been force muted. Uh, yeah, I've got you all on silent. You'll remain on silent throughout the presentation in deference to our speakers. So nobody, you know, if you decide to eat a bag of Doritos, nobody's going to hear it. It's all better that way. I also ask that you keep your cameras off to limit distractions for both the speaker and the audience. If you turn your camera on, I'm going to turn it off. Don't be surprised when that happens. All right. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat throughout the presentation. We will be doing a Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, so we encourage you to do that as time goes on. And with that, I think I will get to the introduction and we will move forward. Uh, though she would never admit it, Zora Neale Hurston was born in Alabama in 1891. Her formative years, however, were spent in Florida, and it's to Florida she would return throughout her life. Here today to discuss Hurston's rootedness in the Florida landscape, including that of Jacksonville, uh, and her leg literary legacy is Dr. Chami Cherry, Professor of English at FSCJ. Dr. Cherry. Thank you, Jennifer. And I love that I'm getting promoted by everyone, but actually uh, I'm not doctor yet, but thank you for that, Jennifer. I appreciate it, the, the um, upsell. <laughs> but anyway, welcome to this presentation on one of my favorite authors, um, one whose work opened a world of discovery for me. And in a time when I think the term genius is bandied about pretty liberally and not always judiciously, I think we can definitely think of uh, Zora Neale Hurston, the person and her body of work as reflective of genius. Um, before we get started, uh, again, thinking about the connection that Zora Neale Hurston has to folklore and to this idea of preserving what can get lost, um, I wanted to give some flowers to some leading thinkers and writers who were who have now become ancestors. As I began to prepare for this presentation a few months ago, I kept going back to scholarship that I hadn't quite uh, revisited in a little while. And every when I clicked on several names, it, you know, it, it would always say this person was a professor. So over the past two years, um, we lost three women who are uh, largely responsible for our um, engagement with uh, Zora Neale Hurston. They were Cheryl Wall, a professor of English at Rutgers University. Um, and she was responsible for um, the scholarship related to Zora Neale Hurston and having her works included in the canon. She spent 30 years devoted to this work. Valerie Boyd, a professor of narrative nonfiction at the University of Georgia, wrote a biography of uh, Zora Neale Hurston wrapped in rainbows. And then Bell Hooks, the distinguished professor in residence of Berea College, um, was also, uh, uh, she was a, a womanist scholar, a public intellectual, a writer of tremendous breadth and energy and very much like um, Zora Neale Hurston in spirit. Um, and so there's this tradition of giving our ancestors their flowers. And so I wanted to, to acknowledge these women without whose work we likely wouldn't be here today because they help um, make us aware of the importance of Zora Neale Hurston's legacy. And of course, I would be remiss if not to mention um, Alice Walker, who's still with us, um, but just to kind of give us a sense for how um, she actually helped, um, yes, uh, bring Zora Neale Hurston to our awareness. She's a stor short story writer and social activist. And so the reason Zora Neale Hurston's, one of the reasons that um, she, her work was rediscovered was through the interaction of uh, Alice Walker. Uh, in the 60s, Alice Walker was working with the civil rights movement in Mississippi. Um, and she was looking for folklore that would connect her to the Southern roots, her own Southern roots and the culture. And she kept finding this very problematic scholarship that did not fully represent black life. And she stumbled upon Zora Neale Hurston's Of Mules and Men and she was like, aha, finally, I found that source and that writer um, who could give me a more realistic and full-fledged picture of Black life. Um, and in 1975, she published an essay looking for Zora. Um, it was first published in Ms. Magazine, um, and it was included in Alice Walker's seminal womanist book, In Search of Our Mother's Garden. And in this essay, she talks about um, going to find Zora Neale Hurston who she finds out um, 
was uh, buried in an unmarked grave and apparently was impoverished at the end of her life. So when she saw this tremendous genius of a woman, she wondered about that. Um, and in connecting with Zora Neale Hurston and her body of work, um, Zora, Alice Walker um, became much more committed to understanding the interior lives of Black women. And she founded this definition of womanism um, in which she talked about how to distinguish and to recognize the contributions of Black women to the broader work of feminism. And so in terms of thinking about her legacy, I'm trying to lay a foundation so that we can understand how far the reach of Zora Neale Hurston's work will be. Um, and so out of that interaction, she came up with this definition. And as you read, and I'll just read this first definition, but it definitely gives us an insight to the types of characters and women that Zora Neale Hurston was interested in exploring in her fiction. And she says, from womanish, a black feminist or feminist of color, from the black folk expression of mothers to female children, you act in womanish, like a woman, usually referring to outrageous, audacious, courageous, or willful behavior, wanting to know more and in greater depth than, than is considered good for one, interested in grown-up doings, acting grown-up, being grown-up, interchangeable with another Black folk expression, you trying to be grown, responsible, in charge, serious. And there are other components to it. What I'm saying is that Alice Walker gave this definition um, in large part because her work was developed um, and reinforced and enriched by her encountering Zora Neale Hurston's work. And on Hurston's influence, Walker writes, condemned to a deserted island for life with an allotment of 10 books to see me through, I would choose unhesitatingly two of Zora's, mules and men, because I would need to be able to pass on to younger generations the life of American Blacks as legend and myth, and their eyes were watching God because I would want to enjoy myself while identifying with the Black heroine, Janie Crawford, as she acted out many roles in a variety of settings and functioned with spectacular results in romantic and sexual love. There is no other book more important to me than this one. And so we see her mark, uh, Zora Neale Hurston's mark on, um, uh, excuse me, yeah, Zora Neale Hurston's mark on Alice Walker. And the title of this presentation, A Genius of Florida, is um, taken from Zora Neale Hurston when she found out that Alice Walker had been buried in an unmarked grave. She traveled to Fort Pierce, Florida, where um, Zora Neale Hurston was buried. And through a series of events, she wanted to find where Zora Neale Hurston was buried. And she ended up at this um, overgrown graveyard, um, possibility there were snakes around, there were no markers, no real clear idea, no map for where she could find Zora Neale Hurston's grave. Uh, and this is a often told story, but um, so she started calling out to Zora's spirit. She's like, Zora, where are you? I don't have all day. Um, please let me know where you are. And she, she recalls that she took a step and she stepped into this indention that was about the length of a casket. And she felt as though Zora Neale Hurston was telling her, here I am. Uh, and so she bought her that headstone, Zora Neale Hurston, a genius of the South, novelist, folklorist, and anthropologist. And she took that, um, that, that phrase, a genius from the South, from a poem by a writer of the Harlem Renaissance named Jean Toomer. And I just wanted to read these couple of verses. The sky lazily disdaining to pursue the setting sun, too indolent to hold a lengthened tournament for flashing gold, passively darkens for tonight's barbecue. A feast of moon and men and barking hounds, an orgy from some genius of the South, with blood hot eyes and cane lipped scented mouth, surprised in making folk songs from soul sounds. Uh, and so she took that, that phrase from Jean Toomer. Um, and so I'm taking that phrase from uh, Alice Walker and titling this A Genius from Florida and focusing on ways in which Florida and this landscape shaped Zora Neale Hurston's life. And so we have to ask, um, how did we get from, you know, um, to that point 
that of, of her being buried in that unmarked grave and Alice Walker discovering that grave and, and this fluorescence of um, Black studies departments and, and womanist uh, literary criticism and, um, uh, and writing. So the beginning of things, again, Zora Neale Hurston was born in Natsagoga, Natsagoga, Alabama. Uh, in 1891, although she tells people it could have been 1898, 1899, 1900, or 1901, um, her family moved to Edenville, Florida, near Orlando, when she was a toddler. She spent her formative years there. She was one of six children born to Reverend John Hurston, a carpenter and preacher, and Lucy Hurston, a former school teacher. Um, it should be Edenville, sorry, was the first incorporated Black township it was a self-governing governing community. And so Zora, and this really becomes important. And I think this is something that caused people to maybe at times misunderstand or misread her. But she grew up surrounded by black people, surrounded by um, you know, being accepted. She was uh, basically at the top of a social hierarchy as the child of a preacher. And um, you know, she was very well educated by her mother. So, you know, this shapes a certain, it puts a certain stamp on her psyche as, as to who she is. Um, Zora's description in her autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road, she talks about Eden, Edenville as a city of five lakes, three croquet courts, 300 brown skins, 300 good swimmers, plenty of guavas, two schools, and no jailhouse. Um, so you do get a sense just from that description that this is going to be a place where a child can flourish a black child in particular, right? Um, and so we see that happening with her. Now, one of the earlier biographies of, um, biographers of Zora Neale Hurston was Robert Hemingway. Um, and so in his book, Zora Neale Hurston, a literary biography, he talks about, um, you know, the oral tradition of, of storytelling um, and how that was pres preserved through slavery. This is what, this is kind of the backdrop in which, um, Zora Neale Hurston arrived, and this is what she experienced daily as she interacted amongst her peers and 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 the adults in her community there in Eatonville. Um, she was, although she was not allowed to interact during the lion sessions um, because her father didn't think that was appropriate for a little girl, uh, but she was a witness to and a, a played attentive ear to the lion sessions on the porch of Joe Clark's. General store. Um, and there they told the folk tales featuring Br'er Fox, God, and the devil. Um, and this was a lush, lush, lush physical landscape of China berry trees, Cape jasmine bushes, oranges, grapefruit, tangerines, guavas. That part sounds a little bit like heaven on earth. And then there are also alligators and snakes, but then also lakes. So again, you just get this real rich kind of a sense for what Florida was then, and this is the world that she was growing in. Um, she was a tomboy, uh, so she could hold her own, and she was physically strong and a very bright student. So again, you're getting, and this she's exceptional in that way, um, you know, because Florida was at that time, it was not an easy place to be. This was the heart of the Jim Crow South, but there was this enclave or this this um, this little slice of heaven in Edenville, Florida. And so again, she moved about in that environment. And this is the poet June Jordan. She talks about Edenville uh, and what that was to Zora. She says it was a supportive nurturing environment. People were free to be their own particular selves in a family and community setting that permits relaxation from hunted warrior postures and that fosters the natural person postures of courting, jealousy, ambition, dream, sex, work, partying, sorrow, bitterness, celebration, and fellowship. All of those things uh, she experienced there. So again, the sense of fullness, a possibility um, of uh, a possibility and a freedom to move about, even though there were certain restrictions in her family environment. Um, just to give you a little bit on John and Lucy Hurston. Again, John was a good provider. He was a carpenter. Um, he was a preacher. Again, in Black life, just about anywhere, 
uh, the preacher is at the top of a hierarchy, right? Uh, but also John served periodically as the mayor of Eatonville. So again, you're getting that sense that uh, although she is a part of that community, in a certain way, there still is a class structure there. Um, she grew up in an eight bedroom house on five acres of land in one memory she writes in dust tracks on a road that they would eat, they would boil uh, eggs and eat them until they were full. Um, you know, they ran around playing, but it was only because it was, you know, their joy to do so. Um, they did, uh, her parents provided a middle class upbringing, but the marriage between John um, and Lucy was very fraught with his infidelity. Um, Lucy was a strong-willed, intelligent, articulate, educated woman. She had been a school teacher, um, and so she could hold her own against her, her husband, but that just made for a really kind of a, a stormy relationship. Um, and this is something that Jordan Neal Hurston bore witness to. Um, and then they had different parenting styles, and you could see that, again, uh, the father sometimes would want to protect more. And John certainly wanted his wife to be stricter with Zora. He felt that she was too free of spirit. He had to remind his wife and even Zora, you know, he would say, you know, at some point she's gonna get punished by this world for being so outspoken and so free. We can't have her move in the space, move in the world without being aware that there should be limitations. She's gotta hold herself in in some kind of, you know, to in order to conform. Uh, and to survive. So that was, and it's not a judgment against John. That was his reality. And John was no, um, you know, he wasn't, uh, wasn't an accommodationist when he had to stand up. Um, if, for example, if, if someone threatened um, the community, he would stand up and, and, and be physical and, you know, react and handle situations. But the idea was that, again, he didn't want his daughter to be punished uh, or suppressed by the culture, so he wanted his wife to kind of teach her how to hold herself in a bit. But Lucy encouraged Zora's boisterousness, boisterous nature, uh, that often quoted line, jump at the sun, right? So he, she wanted her to have unlimited possibility and he, she encouraged her imagination. And this is a quotation I think says everything about Zora. Um, and this is Zora um, recalling in her memoir or in her autobiography. My shoes had sky blue bottoms to them, and I was riding off to look at the belly band of the world. This idea, the again, of the sky and the horizon and possibilities. That's who Zora saw herself to be. Um, and so, you know, uh, there was conflict. Now, this is just an image just to give you a sense of what a middle class residence in Edenville would look like, right? This is the home of uh, Joe Clark. Um, who was a postmaster general. So this is, I mean, this is in the early 1920s. And so that kind of gives you a sense of the type of space that Zora um, would have found been comfortable and familiar with, because again, she grew up in a middle-class family. All right, and so um, as a result of her being brought up in Edenville and having the parents and particularly the mother that she has, Zora Neale Hurston herself writes, but I'm not tragically colored. There's no great sorrow dammed up in my soul nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood who hold that nature somehow has given them a low down dirty deal and whose feelings are all about, all but about it. Um, even in the helter skelter skirmish that is my life, I have seen that the world is to the strong regardless of a little pigmentation more or less. No, I do not weep at the world. I'm too busy sharpening my oyster knife. So again, she's saying there's an idea of blackness, but I don't know that is more related to suffering and sorrow. And she says, no, nah, I think I'm going to do something different. Um, I think there's within this context that we've been born into, there's joy, there's delight. I can get in the thick of it and mix with it as I choose. And that's a powerful thing. So that gives me a sense of hope again and optimism. Now, Lucy, uh, Zora's mom, dies when she's nine, is a very traumatic moment, as it would be for any child to lose a parent. But it was particularly so because before she died, Lucy 
Um, and this seems kind of an irony with Zornia Hurston because we associate her with preserving that folklore, um, you know, representing it in her fiction, documenting it in her folklore. But her own mother actually did not want the common folk rituals associated with dying. Um, and so since dying hard, you know, dying a long prolonged illness was a bad omen. It was considered unlucky. The dead must experience no suffering. That was the ritual. So in order to avoid that, um, if someone were dying, you would remove the pillow from their from under their head because if they had a pillow, that means that dying would be slower. So that would kind of allow the, the process to, to, to continue. Or, um, and then the other thing, you would cover the clock so that it wouldn't break at the time the person's spirit left the body. And you would cover the mirror also so that the spirit as it left wouldn't get frozen in the mirror. Um, and so Lucy asked Sora to not allow the rituals, removing the pillow, covering the clock and mirror, turning the bed to the east. Um, and so her father, however, insisted upon those rituals and he held, he physically restrained Zora from stopping this. And so again, she felt like she failed her mother at her mother's dying request. And Zora writes, that hour began my wanderings not so much in geography, but in time. Then not so much in time as in spirit. Her anchor was gone. Uh, and so she says, from now I'm gonna have to figure out this life for myself, but it's not gonna be here in Eatonville. It's gonna be something different. And when her father quickly remarried, Zora was sent to Jacksonville. Um, and ultimately there was a vicious fight with her stepmother. Um, and from that moment forth, Zora was kind of on her own, um, even though she was very young, she was 14. And so she lands in Jacksonville and she recalls, but changes came when I was 13 and I was sent to school in Jacksonville. I left Edenville, the town of Oleanders, Zora. When I disembarked from the riverboat at Jacksonville, she was no more. It, seems, it seemed that I had suffered a sea change. I was not Zora of Orange County anymore. I was now a little colored girl. I found it out in certain ways. In my heart, as well as in the mirror, I became fast brown, warranted not to rub nor run. Uh, and so again, she leaves that, that uh, womb place of Eatonville and she's thrust out in the world and she begins to experience what it means to be black. Um, and, uh, and so she discovers that when she comes to Jacksonville, um, and she lived periodically with, um, several of her brothers. Uh, this is a picture of John Hurston and his wife, Blanche. Um, he, he, John was one of Zora's older brothers. He owned prosperous businesses and a seven room bungalow. And I think these details are important because sometimes when we tend to think of African-Americans in the past, I know I do. I associate it with a lot of suffering and deprivation and not, you know, not necessarily having. So this idea that there were middle class and even upper middle class African Americans in Jacksonville, Florida, that's that kind of expands our notions, right? We we learn a little bit more and we understand um, the city better, we understand American society better. Um, uh, Blanche was a florist. Zora came to live with John and Blanche when she first arrives in Jacksonville. She attends the Florida Baptist Academy, which is uh, started by Bethel Baptist Institutional Church. Um, and here's a quotation from M. Eline Murrell, um, who wrote uh, Zora Neale Hurston in and around Jacksonville. Zora was good looking with her pecan tan complexion, beautiful hair, starry eyes, and a nice slim figure. So you got, even though she's very young, you got a sense that she's maturing into a young woman. Um, just to show you some additional Jacksonville images, here's the home of John and Blanche Hurston. This picture was taken in around 2004. Um, here's a picture of Blanche's florist shop. So again, I, I don't know that these, these edifices are still standing, but in 2004, these are the images that we have of those locations. Um, one of her best friends when she was growing up and a person who traveled with her uh, periodically was Gerda King. 
and uh, both Gerda and Zora both loved a good party. Um, Gerda's parents worked for a prominent Riverside family, and the two ladies hung out, or young women, hung out in the La Villa section of town, which uh, most of us know, but it was a flourishing center of African-American life in the 1920s. And she also traveled with Zora to the West Indies when she was doing her folklore work. Um, and then Annie King, Gerda's mother, was like a surrogate mother to Zora, and she died in 1930. So again, you get a sense that even though she didn't have that connection to her ancestral home and, and to her father, um, she did have this extended family, and this extended family exposed her to friends who became like family to her. So there was a thread and there was continuity there, even though she was going through a lot of different changes um, at the time. In the article uh, 6, Zora Neale Hurston Sites in Jacksonville, I just pulled some of these images just to show um, these places again that are still standing, right? And in her own memoir, Zora Neale Hurston writes, um, from the time she was a little girl, dogged by clairvoyant visions of her future, Zora knew that in her words, a house, a shotgun built house that needed a new coat of white paint held torture for me, but I must go. I saw a deep love betrayed, but I must feel and know it. There was no turning back. And so again, she's talking about, you know, uh, landing and having to live with, in this case, her brother, John Cornelius Hurston, his residence, um, and just this difficult kind of navigation she had to, uh, to, to experience working with her family and moving from place to place. Um, we also see the Bethel Church there. The Clara White mission is important because when uh, Zora was working with the Works Progress Administration, because she was African American, she could not work with the um, the white uh, writers and researchers and folklorists. And so the Clara White Center housed Zora Neale Hurston and the other African American folklorists. That's where they had to go to do their work because of segregation. So again, these. These, these buildings are still here and they're, they're touch points for our interaction with Zora Neale Hurston. And this is a memory from uh, M. Aline Morrell. I recall once when Zora visited Jacksonville en route back down south to Edenville. She arrived here in high style, having just returned from up north with all the razzle dazzle that she had experienced up there. Her pecan tan skin was flushed, her brown eyes were sparkling, and her hair was cut in a boyish bob. She wore a pants suit and cream or off white, as I recall, and she drove a cream white convertible car with the top down. She had a cigar that was never lit, but she held it real cool. Folks thought she was just about crazy. What had the North done to this little old child from the South? So again, this idea of movement, right? The, the sky blue bottoms to her shoes. Um, Zora, she was a mover. Uh, and it's not for nothing that her her biography autobiography is called Ducks, Dust Tracks on the Road. So um, she starts traveling with an acting troupe. She manages to finish high school. She attends Howard University Prep School and earns an AA degree from Howard in 1921. She starts publishing short stories to Drenched in Light and Spunk brought her to the attention. Um, of Alain Locke and others. And then she attends Barnard College and studies anthropology with Franz Bowes. These are just some of the highlights of her experiences. And so back to that quotation, a call back to that quotation about what had the North done to our Zora. Well, part of what was happening up North was the Harlem Renaissance, right? So that's that flourishing of art and culture center in, centered in Harlem. Um, the technical dates are from 1919 to 1940, but Zora's time there, her imprint was a little bit earlier. But just to give you some sense of Zora as an artist, um, of course, Zora was always trying to, needing to provide for herself. And so she found some benefactors early on. There was Elaine Locke, who was considered the godfather of the Harlem Renaissance, whose idea of the new Negro, the more enlightened cosmopolitan black person who knew themselves and knew their culture. Um, he embodied that expression. Um, there's also the novelist in the upper right hand corner, Fanny Hurst, who wrote um, An Imitation of Life. 
she became an early benefactor of Zora Neale Hurston, and they traveled throughout the United States together, um, often being able to evade segregation because uh, Hurst would present Zora Neale Hurston as a princess or an African princess. Uh, and then godmother or Charlotte Mason, Charlotte, Charlotte Osgood Mason, um, who was a patron of Zora Neale Hurston. And um, this is the idea of, again, Zora as an artist. So in order to get money and to get funding, sometimes Zora would have to play in her own words, play the darky. <laughs> um, uh, she would have to play up the more primitive or um, folksy aspects of her character. Um, but, and this is Langston Hughes writing of, of Zora Neale Hurston. She embraced this idea of herself as an artist. He says, this identity brought Zora Neale, Zora a good deal of attention and she was very quickly recognized in a number of New York circles as a special person. Not only was she Barnard's sacred black cow, so cultivated by her classmates that she encountered little overt prejudice, but she was also a published writer and secretary to a famous novelist. The black child who in Edenville had begged for rice and followed turpentine workers down the road had traveled a considerable distance. She was now a new Negro, a part of the cultural movement illustrating the genius in black souls. Her very presence exposed second class citizenship as an absurd and irrational practice. So this is again Hemingway talking about Zora Neale Hurston. But again, this idea, and we see this repeated and this causes problem for Zora, this idea that she's special, so she gets special treatment. Um, and that special treatment, some people perceived it blinded her um, to certain other realities, but that was just one take on her. Um, and her closest companion throughout the Harlem Renaissance was Langston Hughes. Um, and they, at one point, uh, Hughes came to Florida with Hurston while she was um, doing folklore with the Works Progress Administration. And this was an interesting quotation from Conjure Queen, Zora Neale Hurston and Black Folk Culture by Catherine A. Stewart. Hurston, along with Hughes, sought to establish a more embracing and flexible definition of Black identity that could allow for modernization and a certain amount of assimilation while still enabling them to take possession of essential Black folk traditions as part of a historic cultural legacy. It's this idea you can both be progressive and modern, but maintain that sort of core integrity, which becomes a big, big issue for Zora with her um, inroads in the folklore, this idea that we need to have an authentic representation of Blackness. In this way, Hurston made Black folk culture available as part of a usable past that could be incorporated into her and her contemporaries construction of African-American identity. Through her emphasis on the characteristics of Black folk expression and the transformative nature of its continual reinvention, Hurston showed how Black folk culture was not in opposition to the modernization of Black identity. Rather, Black folk culture was endlessly adaptable. And this is the heart of some of the debate going on at the Harlem Renaissance amongst the writers in particular. Um, what do we do with this folk past? We don't have to suppress it, forget it, cut it off from ourselves and face outward only. We can face outward with a more empowered stance because we have secured the inward. Um, and so again, and we'll see that conflict between the inward and outer to play out as a theme in her work. Uh, and this is just an image of Hurston um, collecting folklore in the late 1930s. And thinking about her folklore, uh, Mules and Men in particular has a two part structure. There are folk tales and tellers, and then there is an investigation of hoodoo, folk medicine, religious practices. She continued her investigation through the Works Progress Administration. And she had to, as a black woman, and again, connecting back to Cheryl Wall, um, Bell Hooks, Valerie Boyd, and Alice Walker, this idea of intersectionality and the complexity of identity. She had to, to navigate complex social position. She was an insider because she was black. She was a, but she was, even though she was black, she wasn't of the folk, she was an upper middle class black in the context of Edenville. 
So there was some, you know, she had to earn her way into those communities. She didn't just naturally fit, but because she was black and she came from these communities, white researchers would think, you know, maybe she's too invested because she's a part of them. So she had to break off that part of her that was the researcher. So there was that. And then as she continued to explore with those sky blue shoes of hers or feet, um, she actually became a hoodoo practitioner herself. She embraced a spiritual practice that made her the ultimate insider in a way. So there are all of these complex positions she's having to navigate. Um, and here she writes in, in Dust Tracks on the Road, I have memories with, within that came out of, mater out of the material that went to make me. Time and place have had their say. Time and place have had their say. And so we turn again to Florida. Um, and I love this quotation from Robert Hemingway. Uh, and this is a picture of a pear tree in bloom. And if we know um, Zora Neale Hurston's Diaries of Watching God, we understand the significance of that image. But Robert Hemingway said, Zora had the map of Florida on her tongue. Um, and you had, of course, in her fiction, you're going to see throughout all of her fiction, citrus trees, palmettos, peach trees, Bermuda grass, Cape jasmine bushes. Um, of Jacksonville, Hurston described the scene around the St. John's River as having smothering foliage that draped the riverbanks and the mouths of purple hyacinths and schools of mullet and catfish as long as a man. So these are all the raw materials that are making her and in the midst of them making her, she's using them and making fiction, right? And we definitely see that in this um, moment in their eyes, we're watching God, this pivotal moment when the character, the main character, Janie, at 16, she's out and she's just musing uh, this idea of, of the interior life of Black women in particular. Um, but she's sitting there musing. It says, it was a spring afternoon in West Florida. Janie had spent most of the day under a blossoming pear tree in the backyard. She had been spending every minute that she could steal from her chores under that tree for the last three days. That was to say, ever since the first tiny bloom had opened, it had called to her to come and gaze on a mystery. From barren brown stems to glistening leaf buds, from the leaf buds to snowy virginity of bloom, it stirred her tremendously. How? Why? The rose of the world was breathing out smell. It followed her through all her waking moments and caressed her in her sleep. It connected itself with other vaguely felt matters that had stuck her outside observation and buried themselves in her flesh. Now they emerged and quested about her consciousness. So you see that weaving in that psychic state, right? Um, a young woman on the blue, on the verge of blossoming and becoming full, a sexually realized woman, and the imagery of the pear tree, the birds, the bees, the puncture in the flesh, all of this beautiful metaphor. For sexuality and she uses her nature to again offer a contrast she uses natural imagery um and and describing the character nanny who's going to force janie to marry a man she does not love and barely knows who's 20 years her senior um when nanny sees uh janie outside kissing a young boy she forces her to marry uh, Logan Killicks, who would be her first of three husbands. But here's the description, again, that natural imagery to contrast. Nanny's head and face look like the standing roots of some old tree that had been torn away by storm. Foundation of ancient power that no longer mattered. The cooling Palma Christi leaves that Janie had bound about her grandma's head with a white rag had wilted down and become part and parcel of the woman. Her eyes didn't bore and pierce. They diffused and melted Janie, the room, and the world in one comprehension. It's just devastating, even now when I read that. Uh, so again, this idea of, of um, in this instance, it's, playing, it's, it's working through these notions of generational trauma and how that affects 
but again, using the imagery, the landscape to convey that. So the themes of Their Eyes Were Watching God, a book that Alice Walker at one point is probably quite considerably higher now. Uh, Alice Walker says she's read a dozen times. Uh, so the themes, and this is where, again, this the, the, the long tail, the generations, um, the influence of Zora Neale Hurston's work. You have gender, you have sexuality, women's voice and agency, female community, both the breakdown and the vitality, and that's community generally as well. The community, community can be both toxic and nurturing and empowering, right? A return to the land, a woman's journey, marriage, colorism, social mobility, the legacy of slavery, generational trauma, suppression, abuse of women, self-ownership, recurring theme, the difference between the outside appearance and the inner reality, the folk, and again, intersectionality, this idea that Janie is, she's, you know, her condition meets at several different intersections, woman, mulatto, higher class, all of these things. Um, and the key metaphor from this book, of course, is this idea that Zora Hill, Neil Hurston is interrogating of black women as the mule of the world. Uh, and so we can see again, talking about Zora's impact, right? Her influence, what was visionary about Zora Neale Hurston. She's rediscovered during the 60s and 70s as the black arts movement and the growing presence of black studies departments at university. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but you have again, uh, Alice Walker is the color purple, dealing with many of the same themes as their eyes are watching God. You have Polly Marshall's praise song for the widow, Gloria Naylor, Mama Day, all drawing from the folklore, right? Those stories, that belief system, the religion, the African, um, sort of the, the, the echoes of African religion in those uh, novels. You got Toni Morrison's Beloved, Jasmine Ward's Salvage the Bones. And then you have Criticism and Theory, Bell Hooks' seminal work, Ain't I a Woman, um, Gail Jones's Corrigadora, Tony K. Bombera's Gorilla My Love, Tina McElroy Ansa, the hands I the hand I fan with. Um, women writing across different, some are more literary, others are more popular, but they all claim Zora Neale Hurston as an ancestor. Um, and then thinking about Zora Neale Hurston and Alice Walker, her most famous book, The Color Purple, was controversial for a lot of different reasons, but part of it was this idea of respectability politics, right? Um, we don't air our dirty business before the world, uh, you know, and there was some controversy about The Color Purple because of its portrayal of Black men. And so uh, there was this in the 80s when the book was published, in particular when Steven Spielberg's movie came out, there was quite a bit of discussion about this, this kind of blooming of Black women writers who were talking about intimate relationships, um, you know, between Black men and women, and the idea that these men are not necessarily portrayed as heroes, but they're complex and at times they behave villainously. And definitely, again, we're pointing back to their eyes were watching God because the series of men that, that uh, Janie marries, Logan Killix, um, Jody Starks, and even Tea Cake, um, you know, they were complex characters. And so there was all sort of controversy and, and uh, picketing of movies and deep discussions amongst Black feminist scholars about the color purple. And I did see a kind of a, a through line with the response to their eyes were watching God for slightly different reason. It seems as though the men didn't really look at the relationship, didn't see the love, didn't see that story as primary, which um, Zora Neale Hurston was more preoccupied with talking about the interior life of women and not protests. In the, in, during the Harlem Renaissance, there was this big discussion and intense discussion um, about what is the black American novel as if there can be only one, but what is the Black and American novel? Um, and Richard Wright, a contemporary of, of Hurston's, wrote of Their Eyes Are Watching Gods, Hurston's characters eat and laugh and cry and work and kill. They swing like a pendulum eternally in that safe and narrow orbit, 
in which America likes to see the Negro live between laughter and tears. This is kind of, in other words, it's hidden all of the stereotypical little bullet points. Uh, and then Alan Locke, he wrote, of course, Zora Neale Hurston, he acknowledged the, the craftsmanship, but he then poses a question. When will the Negro artist of maturity who knows how to tell a story convincingly come to grips with motive fiction and social document fiction? In other words, this idea that in order for us to, um, to be a black novel, we have to talk about racism. We have to talk about, you know, uh, the social structure and political structure of the United States. And Zora was like, no, <laughs> not gonna do it. Um, and so as anyway, subsequent to their eyes were watching God, she continues, Alice, um, Zora Neale Hurston continues writing folklore and novels, including Surf on the Swanee. Um, she's growing as an artist through inter interactions with Florida writers like Marjorie Kennan Rawlings. Um, she tries her hand at screenwriting she faces financial challenges, which is a story to many artists, in particular women artists, um, can identify with. Um, and then in, in 1948, uh, she's accused of molesting a 10-year-old boy, which turns out not to be true. But, and what was interesting about that, that entire experience was that um, it, the, the whole charges, there was no need for them to have ever been aired or made public, but it was actually a black newspaper that, that um, published the details of this scandal. Um, and it had such uh, an effect on Zora Neale Hurston that at one point she wanted to die and may have considered suicide. Because the problem is, although she was fully exonerated and it was found out that the child had lied, um, you know, it's very young, but he had lied. Um, the damage was done. Uh, you know, when you have a charge like that, it's really hard to recover. That would be hard to pull off today. So you can think in, in 1948, how difficult that would have been to recover from. Um, and so that hurt her, that hurt her uh, in a way. So I, could, I think it just, oh, it was just a, a troubling time for her. And then another thing that came up in her later life was her politics. Um, put her at odds with the thinking of the time, with more progressive thinking as it relates to civil rights. Um, so during this, the last 10 years or so of her life, she was dogged by financial crisis, that was true. And she took a work as a maid. And then while she was working, her employer read a short story set in Jacksonville, written by Zora called Conscience of the Court in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, and from that, that she turns to Zora and she says, wait a minute, she reads the name and she says, isn't this the, Zora, isn't this you? And that story got reported in the newspaper uh, um, that Zora Neale Hurston, the famous um, novelist and writer and gad, social gadfly was uh, working as a maid. And so from there, she did get offered, that publicity worked to her advantage and she was offered work and she started writing again. Uh, unfortunately, she got involved in a contentious Senate campaign as civil rights for blacks came to the fore. She supported a conservative, George Smathers, um, in that. And the, the point, I think, and Zora Neale Hurston, um, excuse me, Alice Walker has said this about Zora Neale Hurston. Um, in politics, she was a graduate. She, she believed that equal access will come to black people as they prove themselves worthy. In other words, she was more of the school of um, Booker T. Washington, like just stick to your guns, you know, pay your bills, stay out of trouble, and we're gonna get everything that's, that, that's meant for us, um, as opposed to a much more progressive view. And so she starts, writing, she published an article, I saw Negro votes peddled in Florida, along with others that caused her to uh, receive some criticism from quite a few people and uh, quite a few African-American thinkers and crit critics. But again, that was just one aspect of her, of her personality and her work. She was also at that time working with um, Sarah Creech, who was the designer of the Sarah Lee doll. And I found this is the most, and fascinating thing, up until this time in the 19, early 1950s, um, there were no real black dolls that had 
positive African-American features. There were white baby dolls who were painted black, but there wasn't one that actually had, you know, the, the, the kind of common characteristics we consider to be African-American with the curly hair. Um, and so this is a letter to the, that Zora Neale Hurston is writing to Sarah Creech, who designed the doll. The thing that pleased me most was that you, a white girl, should have seen into our hearts so clearly and sought to meet our longing for understanding of us as we really are and not as some would have us, that you have not insulted us by a grotesque caricature of Negro children, but something conceived of real Negro beauty. And as I was reading about this, um, there was quite a bit of effort to try to choose the right skin tone for this little doll. And actually, when they were working at this on this doll, this was in the city of Belle Glade, which I thought was fascinating because that's where their eyes are watching God was set. Um, and so much of that book has to do with the physical attractiveness of um, Janie, that she's light skinned and colorism uh, comes into play in the second half of that novel. And so, again, a, an interesting convergence. Her final resting place, this was, and I should have put that in quotation mark. This is the house that Zora Neale Hurston owned in Fort Pierce, the little house where she lived there. And this looks again, in the eyes we're watching God, there's a line and I'm paraphrasing where Janie, said, Janie says, I learned long ago that there's a difference between the inside and the outside. And I think sometimes when we think of Zora Neale Hurston, the lead is she dies in poverty in Florida. You see this little house, you think about all of her impact, the things she did, you know, the careers she's made possible, the way she's changed and helped shape our culture. And on the outside, that really looks kind of sad. But if you dig deeply into the research, it seems as though Zora was fine with that because at the end of her life, she was writing, she was creating, she helped in the creation of this doll, whether you agree with her politics or not, she was, you know, stating her opinion related to that. She had a rich set of associations and friendships that were meaningful to her. Um, and throughout, um, in the later years of her life, she was always looking for, you know, needing to make money. And, and her writing was seemingly deteriorating. And that probably had to do with the fact that she was always thinking about money. I, Henry Louis Gates has said that when Zora had money, she wrote well. When she didn't have money, her writing suffered. She was also aging and dealing with the, defect, the effects of that. But there was a common thread in her later life of wanting a place of quiet where she could write. And Zora lived in that house with her little dog Spot. And people, you know, uh, as they would pass by her house, they said it was rare that they didn't hear her in there on a typewriter. Um, so again, the difference between the inside and the outside um, and, and we have to think about that when we're trying to get the totality of Zora Neale Hurston's life. And I like this quotation, and, and I think this is wrapping things up. Uh, Zora Neale writes, I have been in Sorrow's kitchen and licked out all the pots. Then I have stood on the peaky mountain wrapped in rainbows with a harp and a sword in my hands. And I love that because again, some of her story it was hard. It was hard to lose your mother at nine years old. It's hard to be 14 and moving from family member to family member and, and having to deal with racism and having to deal with being a woman, falling in and out of love, choosing not to stay in a long-term committed relationship. There's one question that's often asked about their eyes were watching God, and that is, why is it that Janie never gets pregnant and the issue of having children never comes up? And I think about Zora Neale Hurston's life and how different it would have been if at some point she'd become a mother. She loved children. At one point, she actually was a teacher, but she loved children. She helped design a doll, you know? But her life, we probably wouldn't be talking about her today if she had chosen to have that more conventional life. Um, and so all of the stuff that happened to her, all the things, they were just part of what made her the artist that she, and person that she was. Much, Professor Cherry, uh, I'm going to give everyone a couple of seconds to type any questions in in the chat, which we've had some love for the Zora Festival uh, down in Eatonville come through. So thank you for, uh, I think Jim Matoria shared a link to that. 
Uh, while we are waiting to see if there are any questions, I did just want to go ahead and mention, obviously, here's my pitch for the Library and Learning Commons. Many of the books that Professor Cherry has mentioned today, including Their Eyes Were Watching God and Dust Tracks on an Old Dirt Road, are available in your local LLC, so be sure to check that out. Uh, there's also another one I'll go ahead and make a pitch for, which is another aspect of Zora Neale Hurston's like Florida representation, which is there is a Zora Neale Hurston on food in Florida, um, which is also available in the LLC. Okay. Uh, and we do have a question from Romana for you, Professor Cherry. Uh, do you know why Zora came back to Florida instead of staying in Harlem? I know as I was reading, I think Florida was always home to her. It was her place where she went to reorient herself. Um, her materials was here, were here. She was doing folklore research here, although she traveled to Haiti, Louisiana, other places. Also at a certain point, and I'm trying to remember now the details, but there was, she had, uh, she had tried to get a fellowship. So she was never gonna just stay in Harlem, I think. She was always gonna be moving around. But after the incident of the molestation charges, she found it harder to find supporters. Um, she applied for fellowships and didn't get them. Uh, and so she was able to find a way to book, to find passage on a boat with a friend to Miami. And from there, she kind of always stayed in Florida. That boat trip, again, I'm sorry, I don't remember all the details, but the boat trip was a time where she was able to rest um, be surrounded by the nature, the people that she loved and nurtured her. So I do think there may have been a financial component to it, but there was also this sense that even though she lived this kind of peripatetic life, she's going to move all around. Her home base was always going to be the South and Florida in particular. And she had many associations, deep, deep associations here too. So that would have pulled her home. Her, her brother remained here for pretty much the entirety of her life. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Bounced in and out of Jacksonville. So um, there are obviously very many different places in Jacksonville. You can go and look and see the uh, Zora Neale Hurston sort of remaining trail. Uh, yeah. I do not see any more questions in the chat today, so I'm going to go ahead and pull this to the close. I want to go ahead and thank our speaker today, Professor Tammy Cherry, one more time. A uh, big virtual clap. It's silent because, again, force muted. Sorry, everybody. Um, but thank you all so much for coming out today. We hope you had a, a wonderful time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care.